And today it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you tonight's guest. He is a Chicano man who did not let poverty, addiction, or gangs dictate who he has become. He is an award-winning writer, novelist, poet, political activist, and is now running for governor of California. Let's put our emoji hands together for Mr. Luis J. Rodriguez, baby. All right. My huh? pleasure. My huh? pleasure. Huh? Hey, 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 Luis. You know, I've been looking for you, right? Now. Yeah, I know. I heard about it. That's why I've been hiding. <laughs> He's hiding from the American Cholo. Hiding, hiding. Ah, I've been mm -hmm. looking for you, Hall. Yeah, I heard. I heard. I, 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 I've been emailing. Oh. I've been. I've been sending little kites. I've been sending smoke signals. <laughs> and finally, this gentleman got a hold of me, and they, I said, I, "I got no problem posting that, homie. I got nothing but love with the Rasa." Right, but right. just to let you know, I've been looking for this guy, man. How you yeah, doing, my man? I'm doing good. It's an honor to be here. No, Thank man. You, man. It, it, it's an, it's an honor to have you here, man. I I definitely appreciate you coming on. And let's get this thing going, man. Where were you born and raised? I was born in El Paso, Texas, but we were from Juaritos, the other side. And two years old, we ended up in Los Angeles. And just so people know, I started on the south side. Uh, Watts was my community up to eight years old. What year was this? This is, oh, from 56 to 1960, oh, wow. whatever it was. That's old school. I got out just before the Watts Rebellion. Okay. I, I saw the TV where all the burning, that's my no yeah. neighborhood. Okay. I knew 103rd Street. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that was my community. But we ended up finally in the San Gabriel Valley. And I was in a neighborhood called that we called Loma, so South San Gabriel, which people may not know was actually one of the poorest neighborhoods in LA County. Really? Dirt roads, little shacks on people's, you know, uh, goats and chickens in backyards, no sidewalks. It was a really rough neighborhood surrounded by well-off white people with sidewalks and strip malls and stores. I mean, so we were caught, we were on the east side of LA, but we were more in the side where the Monterey Park and Alhambra, San Gabriel were now more white people were there. But these barrios were these old migrant Mexican neighborhoods, 100 of them in San Gabriel Valley. And they were all poor. You got Monte Flores, you got Sangra, you got, um, uh, I can name what kind of name, La Puente, all kinds of neighborhoods that were just left alone. And we pretty much had a, fight our way through everything, not only not only with other barrios, but all the white people and all the police, because the sheriff's deputies was the main. So we were constant, well, I could say we were in constant war. That's what it was there. So you, you were actually there at the beginning where a lot of these uh, barrios began and, and, and yeah. a lot of the history of, of young Chicanos joining gangs, right? Yeah, I was. And, you know, the whole Cholo thing was really, we were the ones that, I, I don't want to say I started, we started it. Your, gener your generation. generation. Our generation became Cholos. There wasn't Cholos before. There was old Pachucos, and there was a lot oh, of that's other right. things. So you saw that. Yeah, and I remember some of the old Pachucos. Some of them were hypes in the in the strip corners. Of the, they used to have, they used to call them hobos. They call them homeless encampments. They were just yeah. really hoboed. And there were a lot of old Me Mexicano tecatos, you know, and there were old Pachucos. Some, you know, people talk about tattooed faces. I remember seeing these old Pachucos with their faces really? all tattooed. Yeah, they were doing it before anybody was doing it. So. Yeah, uh, that's the sound of the member joining. <laughs> there you go. That, that, that's an angel getting his wings, Chris. There you go. There you go. So I also, uh, I read your book a very long time ago. I had to do a recap, and that's what everybody kind of first got their glimpse at you, and we'll get to that yeah. part, right? But I'm going off stuff of the book. You spoke somewhat about Southgate, and now we think Southgate. We think Raza. We think you. Oh, yeah. well, I think Southgate. I think when they win the soccer game, all these fools going in the, <laughs> with, the, go. with the banderas <laughs> and running around, right? Go. But when you were when you went to Southgate, tell a story. So of when you and your brother went out there one so time, so we were in Watts on the other side, and Watts was black and brown even way back then. It was always mixed black and brown. But the the Alameda Railroad tracks separated us from Southgate, so we didn't have any grocery stores in Watts. There were small little mom and pa stores, yeah. uh, but there was no grocery store. So my mom would say, go get the grocery store. You got to go across the tracks. Mm -hmm. But we knew, me and my brother, now he was nine, I was six, that we had to sneak in there, get the food and get out because mm -hmm. there were these white guys, the racists, that were just waiting to see a Mexican or a black guy come through come there and beat the heck out of them. So we went over there, snuck in there, got out. And sure enough, these teenagers, they weren't even kids, teenagers on bikes mm -hmm. stopped me and my brother and uh, start beating uh, beating us up. They held me, they beat my brother. Uh, these are teenagers, I'm not talking about guys of our age. I would've loved it, I could've hang. Yeah. You know? I could hang with a six-year-old. Yeah, I could hang another five or six-year-old. 
<laughs> but no, it was it was that kind of world, and they just threw us back over the tracks, and that's the way it was in those days. Linwood was like that. All those neighborhoods that are now Raza, yeah. they're now yeah. all our people. It used to be almost all white. It kind of it kind of reminds me of the South and how yeah. right and how the yeah. how the African Americans tell so many stories of white people saying "Get out of here, you end." So you yeah. guys would say the "Get out of here, you spit." Get out of here, you wet back. And that was a normal thing. Beaners, all the words they used to come up with. You know, uh, a lot of the gangs in South Central, a lot of the black gangs were to protect themselves from the white gangs. See, so that's why people don't know the old Slossons and the Gladiators and the Bowery Hunters, oh, wow. the original. They were all created to fight against whites that were still in South Central and or coming out of the Southgate area, that whole part of the town. Yeah, because that area didn't really start getting, uh, uh, what is the white flight to like the yeah. mid-60s or something? I would say by the late 60s, 70s, white flight really hit hard. And uh, maybe by 80s, it was already it was gone, yeah. It was already our people. Yeah, because when I yeah. lived in South in the 80s, it was all Rasa. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it went really quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with almost the valley, too, because I'm in the valley now. A lot of these neighborhoods, I mean, there used to be a Mexican side of the valley. We're in it, North Hollywood, all that. But now the Mexicans are everywhere. Right, right, <laughs> They're right. They're all right. over. So. We just multiply. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so... Boo was supposed to ask this, but he, since he forgot, he's uh, what, what was you guys' relation with the uh, black and brown and watching those areas? Oh, oh no, it wasn't what people think about it now. There was no plate, though. Like you know, it was never like that. I got along. We got along. Uh, the only one that didn't get along with my brother because he was real wet, mm -hmm. and I would turn really brown in summertime. So you know, yeah. I was like, fine. I was like same color as everybody else. And summertime, you get all you know, yeah, petito. <laughs> but my brother, he never could get petito, so ah. he was constantly getting beaten up. But, because of his skin color, but he, he was became, white. But he became one of the best fighters. Really, oh, yeah. he learned practice. to fight. He practiced. So we ended up shortly in the valley in Reseda. Now Reseda is also in one of these Vario La Raza there, but in those days there was nobody. Mm -hmm. It was all white people. And we were there for a short time because my dad just got a job. He thought he could buy a house. He bought a car, bought a TV, but went crazy. We lost it all, mm -hmm. you know, but it didn't matter. We were there. We were being chased by all these white people. Oh. And then I had to deal with all these white people. My brother, he, he was messed right. with him. He beat the heck out of the biggest white people. So they stopped messing with me because my brother could beat them all up. Yeah. And that's because of life growing up in Watts, you know. So Watts was a rough neighborhood, but I never saw it as a, a tension between black and brown. It was more like beefs and people messing with you and that kind of thing. Was was Canoga a little bit of Mexican area still back then? You no, know, with that, I don't know. The only ones I remember out here at the time that was Mexican was this, the northeast side was Pacoima, Van Nuys, and all those areas, you right. know, that now we know is like the Mexican side, yes. even though, like I said, Mexicans are everywhere. But Reseda, man, it's all Raza now. You go there, it's all right, and it's great. Yeah, but, the whole vibe. But yeah. when I was there, man, it was all white people, man. So, yeah. so you also, as a as a child, you, man, you took a lot of abuse. You know what? I took a lot of abuse. I don't know entirely where it comes from. My brother, and again, I love my brother. He passed two years ago. He was only three years older than me, but he um, used to beat the heck out of me. And people don't know about sibling. <laughs> kind of reminds me yeah. of my brother. Abuse. You know, <laughs> sibling abuse we don't talk about. Yeah, we talk brother. about parental abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Sibling abuse is bad. Yes. People don't know how bad it is. Uh, it actually messes with you. Yes. My brother used to do everything short of kill me. And I think he tried to kill me two or three times. <laughs> uh, he would do something silly like keep me, like I would follow him because I didn't have nobody to hang with. So I would yeah. follow him to his little home, his little friends. And he would have his friends beat me up. <laughs> That's, that's I mean, we can laugh at it now, but back then you're a kid. That's and some scary stuff kid, going on. Yeah, and he tried to choke me to death, and he threw me off rooftops and did everything Jeez. you could imagine. Yeah. So your father yeah. was actually an educated man, right? So he, unlike a lot of Mexicans, they came as workers. Some of them no education. Like my wife's mom and dad only went to first grade. My dad and my mom were both highly educated. I mean, secundaria. I mean, they weren't college so but much. for the time. For the time. You get a secundaria, you're, you're educated. So he became a principal of a high school. That was out and there in Juarez? In Juarez. Okay. And so, but just really quickly, the story was that he had a lot of political enemies there mm -hmm. with the PRI and everything. He was not um, liked, and so they wouldn't give him any money for his school. Mm -hmm. So one year he had to uh, take down the fence and sell the parts to get school supplies. Oh, and they arrested wow. him for stealing property, and he ended up in jail wow. in Ciudad Juarez. And then when he left, when he got out of jail, he just told, said, my mom, I'm done with Mexico. Yeah. I'm going to the United States, I'm done. 
And, yeah. and, and yeah, in your book, you read, I, I saw that part where your dad was like, he's going there, I'm making it one way or another. He came he determined, right? He was going right? to do it. He was so determined to make the American dream. Now, the problem with that is, of course, it was more a nightmare than a dream. Uh, we lost so many jobs. There was so much instability. We were constantly being put one, one house to another. You're talking about many schools. I yeah. went to about eight, at least eight elementary schools. We were always back and forth. And then we ended up at South San Gabriel, which is one of the really rough, poor neighborhoods. It was really bad. But it was all Chicanado. I mean, it was all our hinted. That's when I really got to get the sense of what it is to be Chicano. Because nice. even in Watts, I didn't write. I was Mexican and everything. But in, in South San Gabriel, it was raza like Chicanos. I mean, they had that mixture of Spanish and English. Right. They, had the right. Right. They, yeah. were, they were really, and then they had this barrio street life. So I, that's where I really learned all that. So you got into the street life fairly young. I was at, I would say eleven years old That's when, very young. when I ju got jumped into my I went to about three different little incarnations of gangs, but it all became Lomas. Okay, well, let's, but let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about those incarnations. I'm, I'm I'm very curious to hear about them. So the first was we started little clubs. We all thought we clubs, you know. So the first one was called the impersonations. What kind of clubs were you guys just? We're just clubs, we're like just, little rascals, or what? Party <laughs> club, but more like little rascals when you're eleven years old. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, how about, yeah, you right. don't know, you know what a party is, but anyway, right. we're little. We just they have a little club, but you know what happens? You have a little club. The other guys come around and say, "Hey, man." Who you? Where you at? Where yeah. you from? What club you from? Yeah, and then pretty soon other clubs were messing with us. But then the Lomas was ha all hanging over everything, and pretty soon all the clubs became part of Lomas. Yeah. They all got jumped in. So, but we jumped people into impersonations. It wasn't just okay, like let, just join the club. We jumped people in. I don't know where we come up with this stuff where we had to jump people in, and then and then we had little. Uh, jackets yeah. you know we who knows why why we did all that stuff we had little cards it didn't last very long because once you're in Loma, you guys even had cards we had uh, are you from the club? Yeah. exactly hey, you guys started you members go. only there you go we started we could have made millions, millions by now yeah but uh, i think that's what it was and it was just kids you know I, they were just lost boys yes you know? mm -hmm. we weren't didn't have any much lot of fathering and i hate to say that because i think there's good fathers out there yeah, but, but but it's true you yeah. know and my dad uh, to be honest with you just worked all the time my mom yes. worked all the time so i was a latchkey kid in the in, you know somebody had to fall to the cracks it was me yeah uh, my brothers uh, my brother and my two sisters from my, my dad he always had four other half brothers sisters uh we were just um latchkey kids but i was the one that fought to the crack you know mm -hmm. so so what, what, was. what was the last neighborhood that you were in before you guys got into Lomas? So it, it, it started another little club called the, the Little Gents. Okay. And then we started one called the Southside Boys for South San Gabriel. This is what got us in trouble. Yeah. Because Sangra, we said South Sangra. We had a jacket, Southside Boys, South Sangra. Ah. And Sangra was for San Gabriel, the mission, old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. they would, we would go show up in carnivals and wear little jackets. And they came up and they said, you ain't, they ain't no South Sangra. Yeah, you either sangra or you and nothing. And I go, what? Wow, you can't tell us what to do. Oh man, they they would jump us. <laughs> so the only refuge we had was the Lomas would say, man, you got to be Lomas. You can't be, can't be, you can't be nothing either. You can't, you got to be Lomas or sangra. And that I, I, I jumped into the Lomas. You know? Did you have to get jumped into those other three gangs? I so got it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you got a super whip in. You know, actually, the only two I, I got jumped in the impersonations, and then um, there was the the Lomas. The first in, in Clica, right? The Chicos, and then I got jumped in again to be part of the Locos. Oh wow! Okay, Which at that those. time was the hardcore guys. So, yeah, yeah, you, you come, yeah, come yeah. to the Locos. Oh, they you, you had to be right? sponsored. Yeah, yeah, you know how it oh, is. Yeah, you had sure. to have a guy, a homie, saying, "I, I vouch for this dude." Yeah. You, know, you couldn't just get in because a lot of guys were trying to get in, and people would say. Yeah, here we don't want you. You're not crazy to, enough. Yeah, and all this happened when you're 11, 12, 13 years 11, old. Yeah, I got out of it by 19, 20 years old. So uh -huh. all that was going through that. And you know, once you start that life, then yeah. you're in the oh, street, yeah. then you're getting busted, and then you're in juvenile hall, and then you're uh, not going to school. Uh, I got kicked out of schools. Uh, I was homeless for about three years during oh, that wow. time. Oh, wow. Well, so how did yeah. that come about, you becoming homeless? Well, my mother threw me out. That was it. And my dad's a good way. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to follow the rules, go. <laughs> That's exactly what. That's, and, yeah. and, and, you know, my dad, um, he didn't really have a lot of connection. You know, I don't know if you guys know, uh, I don't mind talking about fatherhood, but some dads are frio. You know, they're very emotionally detached. Mm -hmm. My dad was like that. So he didn't really get involved. He should have locked me around, but he didn't do nothing. Yeah. It was my mom. and But she would always say, el rey is... It's to papa. But, but and I think, Manda. I think, but, I think yeah. Louis, that's the case for the majority of yeah. Chicano kids, Mexican kids, yeah. even and, that are in gangs. Because, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with, you know, our, like not my father. I never knew my father, but like my, yeah. my family's father, same thing. He just works, takes care of the family, yeah. and the mom's the yeah, one kind of. Exactly. That's what it was. And, you know, a lot of my homies didn't have dads, and they would complain 
whenever I complained about my dad, they would say, well, at least you got a dad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They had a point. <laughs> but, but he might as well not be a dad, that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So my mom threw me out, and then I was in the streets. Uh, and then what happened is it got really cold. You know, I didn't mind the streets, actually. Uh, I had a thing where I, would, I was already on heroin. I started heroin, I would say, uh, 12 years old, but I was just snorting it or putting it on weed and everything. Then I started shooting it up at 15. Oh, Jesus. So by the time that I was in the street, I was already shooting up. But I re- it was, it made, this party would save me. I hated shooting up with other people. Cause they were all start sharing i didn't do it for those reasons i didn't know anything about sharing needles yeah right. i just hate it to be around other people mm-hmm. so i would carry my edit find my spot usually abandoned car be on the building and just shoot up myself part of the most part yeah i had close homies mm-hmm. that i shot up with girlfriends you know hyenas that you know we shot up together but i it probably saved me because what a lot of guys got liver damage from that time oh yes because mm-hmm. they were shooting up in these dens and oh. among with other people and they didn't really care i think it saved me that i just pretty much was my own who, guy. Who introduced you to that poison? You know what? It, it comes from the street, man. It's really funny because I don't think we had cared about it. We knew anything about it. We weren't you meant know, to the, be the real addicts. dangerous of it. Just... All of a sudden, it pops up, man. All of a sudden, people, we, we weed, everybody had weed. But then all of a sudden, somebody, people are, oh, hey, man, you want to try some kataga? Kataga, what's kataga? You know, I'm gonna try it, you know. Okay. And they don't shoot it up right away because you will OD and die. Right. So they, they, they treat you, they kind of prepare you. You put it in grooming in, you. Yeah, the grooming you. You store it. You put it in your cigarettes or you put it in your weed and you, know, you put it in powder. Yeah. Eventually you're shooting it in the in the in the muscle, which is not as direct. And oh. then then you get to the point where hey man, I, I, I need, I need more. Yeah. And then you think, well, uh what I can shoot up in a day, okay, I'd be cool, but then pretty soon you're shooting up um in a day what you uh, you're shooting up in in a day what you would in a week. In other words, things are escalating. You need more and more, and I used to have the attitude I'm never going to be like the that got on the corner, the button the junkies right. on me. I'm not going to be like that. And then pretty soon, you get you find yourself in that corner, you and know, you, you like, got to feed the beast, you got to feed the beast, and that's the terrible part of heroin. And I, I do think it was um, out of design, not our design. I think there was something systematic about why it hit all these neighborhoods, mostly black and brown neighborhoods. Uh, white kid people were involved too, but mostly they were the bikers. Uh, mostly they were, uh, you know, the, the ones they would call white trash. To them. Yeah, white trash, outlaw, right, um, outlaw yeah. whites. Uh, but it was our barrios and our ghetto neighborhoods that had heroin, and it came in hard. And almost everybody in my neighborhood, I would say almost everybody, at least in my group of homies, Generation. was was uh, really? was had or had an addict. What, yeah. what what year was wow. this? This is so. This would be the six late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. How was the dress code in those years? Well, we were all cholillos. Now, the cholo thing came out of the the La Campo, came out of the Juvenile Hall, came out of Preston and all the different oh, the institutions, YAs, huh? the YAs, because they gave you certain ways of dressing, and then yeah. pretty soon ah. the Chicanos figured out a way to make them look cool, you know, and there was always wow. extra baggy, yeah. and then if you, you could take them home, and if you take them home, or you can find them like that, you know, the khakis, you yeah. start creasing pressing them, them creasing <laughs> them up. Oh, wow, this is a great it, history. It, it, it came is. out of the institutions that everybody was going through. And, from from um, Stacey Adams to tennis shoes. Exactly. Huh? <laughs> and then we had the old Stacey Adams. That was the, the best shoe. And you had to sign them up, keep them cool. You know, we, we were cholos, but we dressed up. Now, the only problem was once you're not homeless and heroin, yeah. your yeah. khakis yeah. are not creased, <laughs> creased anymore. anymore. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah, khakis but, by that point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's yeah. interesting. So, the, the, so before that, that, that era, it, everybody was still a little pachuco out of the 50s? There were still pachucos there. And they were still had the pachuco style. So they were the, the, the tandos, you know, the hats. And they had uh, the, the pantalones and the, and the suspenders were still there. You know, there was more like that. Uh, but the cholo thing kind of Really turn, turned turned around. It, huh? it overtook it. So what? what the year penalties, you? but the big size penalties. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's when you didn't put them on. You put them yeah. over your arm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You didn't wear you a penalty. Just to now, put them just and you arm. know, surfers yeah. had penalties, but mm-hmm. it was yes. always tight. It was, mm-hmm. and we had them cool. Yeah, and we would actually crease them too. We would actually yeah, starch right. them and keep them sharp. They could yeah. stand up by themselves. So, what year would you say? And this is just your opinion. Uh, would you say was the uh, the death of Pachuco? 